Professor Stuart Corbridge, Vice Chancellor of Durham University, and Ms. Joan Sims, His Excellency, the Ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the Chief of Defense Staff, uh, the Campus Registrar of the St. Augustine Campus of the University of the West Indies, Dr. Darren Conrad, Deputy Dean for Distance Education and Outreach in the Faculty of Social Sciences, Professor Hamid Ghani, Director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies here at St. Augustine, members of the St. Augustine campus, specially invited guests, media, ladies and gentlemen. Before we start, I'd like to ask that you turn off your mobile telephones or you put them on silent, please. We don't want to have bells ringing during the, uh, during the evening. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to this campus of the University of the West Indies and to this lecture on the topic of Sir W. Arthur Lewis and the Possibility of Development by Professor Corbridge. This lecture is part of our distinguished lecture series as well as one of the events uh, that we are hosting to honor the life and work of Sir Arthur Lewis, the Nobel Laureate and the first Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. And some of you might wonder why he was the first Vice Chancellor. Until he became the head, the academic head of this institution, the title that was used for the head was principal. Sir Arthur was the first to use the title of Vice Chancellor. Sir Arthur, who formulated a systematic strategy for industrial growth in the West Indies, of course, is one of three Nobel, Nobel laureates associated with the University of the West Indies. As you know, the other two are Savidian Naipaul and Derek Walcott. Some of you may know that several events have taken place across all campuses of the UWI today uh, to analyze and to mark the significance of the work of Sir Arthur in light of the economic challenges that uh, the West Indies, these territories currently face. Indeed, some of you will have attended the symposium here at St. Augustine earlier today during which aspects of the life of Sir Arthur were addressed. These events too, uh, the celebration of the life of Sir Arthur, also form part of the 70th anniversary celebrations of the University of the West Indies and highlight our continuing support for and commitment to the development of the West Indies. Now, we have been reminded by Professor Carrie Polanyi Levitt, who spoke in the seminar earlier today and who we have the pleasure of welcoming this evening that Sir Arthur's article in 1954 entitled Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor contributed to the development of, to the establishment of development economics as a specialized field of study. Since it dealt with the mechanism of transferring surplus labor from traditional activity to a modern capitalist sector under conditions of unlimited supplies of labor. The citation for Sir Arthur's Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences emphasized, I quote, his pioneering research into economic development with particular consideration of the problems of developing countries, specifically for the development of economic models which define the causes of poverty among the populations of developing countries, as well as the factors determining the unsatisfactory pace of development. Now, many of you will know that Sir Arthur had a varied career. He studied at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. He taught at Manchester University. He served as economic advisor to the Prime Minister of Ghana. He served as Deputy Managing Director of the UN Special Fund. He served as Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. And from 1970 to 1974, he oversaw the establishment of the Caribbean Development, the Development Bank, among many other things. While these varied experiences augmented his understanding of the issues and processes of development, his experiences as the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies actually sharpened that understanding. As you know, this is a very complex and, uh, 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 institution with a great many challenges. Uh, he pointed out in his, Nobel, in his speech at the Nobel Banquet in December 1979 that, quote, Education is a great growth industry in the third world. Since the Second World War, we have multiplied the number of children in school by four, 
with even larger multiples for secondary and university education. This is a turbulent process. We cannot give our students all that they expect, whether by way of the quality of their schooling or by way of the jobs that they are hoping to get. Student frustration is a worldwide phenomenon, pushing our societies into adjusting faster than they're used to. Now, that frustration is something of which we are very much aware in our institutions of higher education and to which we are obliged to create urgently the appropriate responses as we prepare the people of our contributing countries, our 18 contributing countries in the Commonwealth Caribbean, especially our graduates, to react to the imperatives of adjustment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken quite a bit, and I'd now like to invite Dr. Darren Conrad, the Deputy Dean for Distance Education and Outreach in the Faculty of Social Sciences, to address you. Dr. Conrad. Professor Stuart Corbridge, Vice Chancellor, Durham University, and Ms. Joan Sims. His Excellency, Giles Beale, Ambassador to the, United, to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and other members of the Diplomatic Corps. Commander Hayden Pritchard, Chief of Defense Staff. Members of the Campus Executive, Mr. Richard Saunders. And faculty and deans, Dr. Hamid Ghani, Director, Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. Dr. David Rampersad, Senior Advisor to the Vice Chancellor, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, this evening I'm here to bring you some uh, re remarks and uh, based on the day's proceedings, it has been very revealing in examining some of the works and what it meant to some of the younger re researchers and in development economics and in other areas that have, we have been exploring on the campus. Uh, the United Nations Chronicle in March 2008 cited Sir Arthur Lewis as a pioneer in development economics. Indeed, uh, one of his best known contributions was that same paper titled Ec Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, which was written in 1954 and uh, for which he received Nobel Prize in Economics in 1979 alongside Chicago, Illinois economics professor Theodore Schultz. Uh, and this work modeled the transfer of labor from traditional to modern capitalist sector in conditions of unlimited supplies of labor. He followed the article with a well-received overview of development economics called the theory of economic growth. And in both articles, he attached a lot of importance to education and social development as agents of change. Now, one of the reasons I often reflect on this particular statement and the, the theme in, in this body of work is that it provided, it was one of the reasons that mo motivated me into undertaking my own research in examining human capital and its role in economic growth and in what I thought was the failure of the region to mobilize the human capital into productive activities to generate significant levels of growth. And when examining human capital is often very tricky because human capital is one of those elements that is part of the human capital is used in production of new human capital and part is used in the production of human and, and hum production of goods and services. So it's very, very complicated in modeling human capital. Albeit, I continue to investigate that, and that continues to be the motivation for my own research. Now, Lewis's writings also examine the relationship between trade and development, and, it re and that too remains a major unresolved problem in the contemporary world. His insights into the mechanisms of tropical primary exporting economies argued in his Nobel lecture have lost none of their relevance. Indeed, and as we went through the course of today and listening to some of the presentations, a lot of his writings still have a significant amount of relevance in what we are talking about today as problems facing the region. More importantly, Sir Arthur Lewis's work is more variegated and it spans a wider conspectus from sociology to political science Indeed, he was a pioneer, a great thinker, and a revered social scientist. 
As I reflect on his writings and continue to reflect on Sir Arthur Lewis's writings, I am reminded of the importance of letting both casual and careful observation of societal issues form the basis for our own scientific investigation while allowing the fundamental tenets of theoretical constructs to guide our thoughts in the creation of new frameworks to address our challenges. Sir Arthur Lewis was wholeheartedly devoted to the, research, to the search to, of solutions to development challenges of developing countries. As a matter of fact, it is well documented that that was his constant preoccupation. And so I think that is it important for us to continue to work on addressing the challenges and the spirit of Sir Arthur Lewis to do so in an interdisciplinary fashion. So I hope that the conversations that we started during the course of today, and of course the lecture that we will be listening to this evening, and as we continue to think about all of our work that we continue to do, our personal reflections, that we let Sir Arthur Lewis's work continue to serve as the impetus in guiding our thinking and to continue to inspire us, inspire us to continue to develop innovative ways for solving the region's problems. Thank you, and again, welcome to this evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Conrad. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hamid Ghani is no stranger to most of you. He's the director of the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. He is, of course, very well known for his astute and discerning analysis of constitutional and parliamentary matters. And he will now introduce our distinguished lecturer, Professor Corbridge, Dr. Ghani. Thank you very much, uh, David. Professor Stuart Corbridge, Vice Chancellor, Durham University, and Ms. Joan Sims, members of the Diplomatic Corps and Ambassador for the Kingdom of the Netherlands, the campus executive management team, and I recognize uh, our campus registrar, Mr. Richard Saunders, here this evening, <clears throat> the Chief of Defense Staff, Commodore Hayden Pritchard, Dr. David Rampasad, Senior Advisor to the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies and the Chair of this evening's proceedings, members of the campus community, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure for me uh, to be called upon to introduce Professor Corbridge for this lecture this evening. And I want to start by saying that uh, Professor Corbridge joined Durham University in 2015 from the London School of Economics and Political Science, where he served as deputy director and provost. In 1978, he graduated with a BA honors degree in geography from Sydney Sussex College, and he continued at Cambridge for his PhD, which was focused on the politics of ethno-regionalism in Jharkhand, India, and has carried out field-based academic work in Eastern India ever since. Alongside this, he has also worked extensively in that region for the UK's Department for International Development, including on public service delivery issues, joint forest management, participation, and empowerment. His major publication with Glyn Williams, Manoj Srivastava, and René Veron in 2005 remains Seeing the State, Governance, and Governmentality in India. He has held posts at Huddersfield Polytechnic, Royal Holloway College, Bedford New College at University of London, and the Maxwell School of Public Affairs at Syracuse University in New York. In 1988, Professor Corbridge was appointed to a lectureship in South Asian Geography at Cambridge University and was elected to a fellowship at Sydney Sussex College. He remained at Cambridge for the next 11 years before taking up a post of Professor of International Studies at the University of Miami in Florida in the United States, and later a Chair in Geography at the London School of Economics and Political Science. He became the head of the Department of International Development in 2007, and from 2010 served as Pro-Director for Research and External Relations. In 2013, Corbridge was appointed 
as the first deputy director and provost of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and has led work to develop LSE's core undergraduate course, LSE 100. And more generally, he led work to improve systems of academic recruitment, mentoring, review, and reward. In 2017, Professor Corbridge was appointed to the Board of Directors of the Association of Commonwealth Universities. In 2015, while at the LSE, Professor Corbridge was very instrumental in creating the W. Arthur Lewis Chair in Development Economics. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in giving you Professor Stuart Corbridge. very much indeed. Um, Mr. Ambassador, Chief of Defense Staff, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the University Executive Team, distinguished colleagues here at the University of West Indies, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm good evening from myself. I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Ghani and the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute for Social and Economic Studies at the University of West Indies for hosting me today and for giving me the honor of presenting the 2018 Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture on what would have been Sir Arthur's 103rd birthday. As a Vice Chancellor myself, it also gives me great pleasure to remind you, not that you need reminding now, that Arthur Lewis was indeed the first Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. And if you've seen any photographs of Sir Arthur, you will know that he was always impeccably dressed. Um, thanks to British Airways, unfortunately, I'm not quite as impeccably dressed, uh, having uh, some problems with my baggage. But I'm extremely grateful to the principal, Principal Copeland, for lending me a rather nice blazer for tonight's talk. I, I, I will give it back at the end. So I've been familiar with Sir Arthur's work since undergraduate days in the 1970s. And I still consider his book from 1955, which we heard about before, The Theory of Economic Growth, to be one of the most lucid and informative accounts of economic growth and development ever written. And there's not a single equation in that book. I happened to read the book again a few years ago when I was working at the LSE, where W. Arthur Lewis himself was a student, as we've heard, and later a faculty member. And I've read it again with pleasure just after Christmas for this talk. As most of you will know, the work that won Lewis the Nobel Memorial Prize in 1979, which again we've just heard was shared with one of his greatest critics, Theodore Schultz from the University of Chicago, that was mainly written at Manchester University in the 1950s, some years before Arthur Lewis received his knighthood in 1963, which of course you will know was the same year that he left the University of West Indies for what became his final academic posts at Princeton University. Arthur Lewis was the first and to date the only academic of African and Caribbean heritage to win the Nobel Prize in economics. My interest in Sir Arthur though and my respect for his work and legacy is not confined to his famous works from 1954 and 1955 although I will mainly refer to those two works tonight. We had a wonderful seminar this morning showing the multifaceted nature of Sir Arthur's legacy and contributions. I believe that Lewis's work and life also have something profound to tell us about what I will call the possibility of development in the post-1945 world system. So to anticipate, I will make two main arguments this evening. First, agreeing with the previous speaker, that Arthur Lewis is indeed the true father of what is today called development economics, 
His work in the 1950s provided the first and the most complete theory of economic growth for what were then still referred to as backward countries, or what we would today call the developing world. Second, I'm going to argue that Lewis's encounters with racism, both before and after the world, world War II, placed him squarely in the center of a much less discussed fight for people of color to be considered fully human, which is a phrase that comes from W.E.B. Du Bois, who I'll come on to later, and the authors of their own fortunes. This was a status determinedly not given to many people of color in the decades of social Darwinism that spanned either side of 1900. In my view, the possibility of development that opened up after 1945, the radical view that the rest of the world could become like Europe or North America depended at least as much upon struggles around race as it did around the new geopolitical landscapes of the Cold War. Arthur Lewis, as the first black faculty member at LSE, and much later as the first black faculty member at Princeton, was central to this struggle, this double movement. Although not a fan of black studies himself, Lewis was much exercised by the absence of men and women of African or Afro-Caribbean descent from the academy in the United States and the UK, and I share that concern today. So let me begin with some path-clearing remarks about this strange concept, the possibility of development. We take it for granted today that all countries can develop, boost their GDP, raise living standards and well-being, prolong life expectancies. Indeed, development has become the great imperative of the post-World War II era and an enormous industry, as we know, has grown up around it. I want to argue, however, that while ideas of progress and improvement were common in metropolitan countries in the 19th century, the idea that the colonized or so-called peripheral world could be improved, the word that was used then, was not widely entertained in the metropolitan powers. The possibility of development then is a far more recent invention than is commonly recognized. Now, I'm going to trace that argument through the life of Arthur Lewis. So let me expand and personalize. William Arthur Lewis was born in St. Lucia in the British West Indies on the 23rd of January, 1915, his parents having moved there some years before from Antigua. Now, here and throughout the talk, I'm going to be indebted to Lewis's biographer, Robert Tignor, although he is rather silent on the West African roots of the Lewis family. In broader terms, this is to say that Lewis was born in a British crown colony towards the end of an extraordinary 150-year period of world history that economic historians now refer to as the Great Divergence, or what Eric Hobsbawm earlier called the ages of capitalism and empire. Stephen Radelay and Geoffrey Sachs capture the scale and nature of the changes wrought in this period when they write as follows. With but 14% of the world's population in 1820, Western Europe and four colonial offshoots of Great Britain, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the United States had already achieved around 25% of world income. By 1950, their income share had soared to around 56%, while their population hovered around 17%. Asia, with 66% of the world's population, had a meager 19% of world income, compared with 58% which it had in 1820. So this is the idea of the great divergence. Put another way, we can say that what was named as le tiers monde by Parisian intellectuals in the early 1950s was produced as a site of relative and absolute poverty, mainly in the period from 1800 to 1950, which is when today's enormous global income disparities, which are now shrinking, came into being. The stated purpose of the development industry, needless to say, is to close the gap. 
But Lewis was also born in 1915 into a world economic system that for the first time in history was increasing wealth and life expectancy for ordinary households and not just economic and political elites. This much is evident uh, from a rather nice diagram from the work of Gregory Clark, which plots income per person on the vertical axis against a baseline of one in 1800 over a period of 3,000 years. And what you can see here, I hope fairly clearly, is that it's only from the late 18th century that certain countries and households in the West begin to escape what the author of the slide, Gregory Clark, calls the Malthusian trap of the pre-industrial or pre-capitalist era, a trap which saw increased incomes rapidly consumed by increased population growth. It's only from around 1800s, in other words, that the generalized emergence of capitalist relations of production in Western Europe put in play incentive regimes that ensured consistent technological change and improvements in productivity. It's a very recent phenomenon. Because capitalist development did not occur at the same time in other parts of the world, notably in the non-settler colonies where it was often held back or repressed, a great divergence opened up between rich and poor regions or countries. Much the same point is made in the next slide, again from Gregory Clark, which plots average life expectancies at birth for different world regions across this period. Harking back to Arthur Lewis, we can see that men and women living in the United Kingdom, his island's colonial master, saw their life expectancies increased dramatically from 40 years on average in 1820 to 69 years in 1950, with particularly rapid growth from 1900 to 1950. And you can see similar patterns across Western Europe and the US, and more interestingly, perhaps, in Russia and Japan. In Latin America, however, and the Caribbean where Lewis was brought up, average life expectancy in 1950 only just reached above 50. Meanwhile, in Africa, that vast collection of states and quasi-states from which his family originated, life expectancy at birth averaged only 38 in 1950, at the end of the Great Divergence. In that part of the world, as in India, where life expectancy was only 32 after 200 years of British rule, the possibility of development was not yet widely entertained or meaningful. While progress and civilization and the civilizing mission were key words in the capitals of Western Europe and other imperial powers or pretenders, it was not generally thought possible or likely, save by emerging nationalist elites, that progress would come quickly to the tropical world. And it was considered even less likely that progress or development could be brought to the colonized world by the subjects of empire themselves. That task, insofar, it was, insofar as it was acknowledged at all, fell to the colonial masters. It was their burden to bear. So that's the world into which Arthur Lewis was born. Let me turn now to the best known story of Arthur Lewis, scholarship boy, brilliant young faculty member at LSE, and soon to be father of development economics. Although St. Lucia was ruled by a small white elite before universal suffrage came to the island in the early 1950s. The black majority on the island was not, according to Tignor, and I quote, subject to the daily humiliations that characterized the lives of African Americans in the United States. Arthur Lewis flourished in the competitive and classically oriented island scholarship system that the British set up in the West Indies. And young men like Lewis, and Eric Williams, of course, later the Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago, transferred to British universities more or less on par in terms of their academic training with the white peers they joined in the UK, as Lewis did when he arrived at the LSE in 1933, 
to study for the BA degree in commerce. Lewis, indeed, enjoyed a stellar career as an undergraduate at LSE, which had recently been much expanded under the directorship of William Beveridge, essentially the father of the welfare state in the UK. Lewis gained a first when he graduated in 1937, together with many prizes along the way. Tignor tells us that Lewis's main professorial contact at this time, Arnold Plant, the head of the Commerce Division, immediately recommended that Lewis be admitted to the school's PhD program. Plant declared in his reference, quote, Lewis is the most brilliant of all graduates whose work I have seen since I returned to the school. He is already a mature, independent, and original thinker with a quite exceptional literary capacity. It's worth noting that last remark. Economics before the late 1950s was not mainly a quantitative discipline. Its main proponents were expected to write clearly and crisply in good prose, as the great Maynard Keynes did at Cambridge, the main rival at this time as a center of economics in the UK to the LSE. In any case, Lewis joined the PhD program. That wasn't his first career choice, and I'll come back to that, and continued his studies at LSE under the guidance of three main mentors. Plant himself, and primarily, but also Lionel Robbins and Friedrich von Hayek, two titans. As is well known, the last two of these men were major critics of Keynes and the burgeoning Keynesian revolution that would soon sweep economics. At this time, Lewis worked mainly on farm pricing policies and overhead costs. His first book, which was published in 1949, was titled Overhead Costs and was one product of his PhD work, along with several published articles. In 1938, however, moving backwards, after just a year of doctoral work, the LSE took what Tignor rightly describes as the momentous decision to invite Lewis to join the school's faculty as a temporary one-year assistant lecturer in economics. Lewis accepted the invitation and became the LSE's first black faculty member. Although his doctoral work was on firm, firm pricing and overhead costs, Lewis was asked to teach much more widely including on the Great Depression and international economics. By 1943-1944 academic year, Lewis was offering a course on colonial economics. Again, note the title. And when he was promoted to a readership at the school in 1947, it was as a reader in colonial eco economics. As Tignor notes, Lewis's course at LSE on colonial economics was unusual for LSE and for most top UK universities. And I quote, courses dealing with the rest of the world, particularly the colonial world, were taught then in history or anthropology departments. Economists concerned themselves with trade, money, banking, and the like, and to some degree with the economic history of the UK and Europe. Lewis, though, enjoyed the company of men like T.S. Ashton and Bronislaw Malinowski, at LSE, respectively an economic historian and a very famous anthropologist, and learned as much from them as from Robbins and Hayek. Indeed, it was his conversations with non-economists, as much as his growing familiarity with the work of Keynes and his circle, that took Lewis away from the free market economics of some of his most esteemed LSE colleagues. By the time that Lewis took up the Stanley Jevons chair in political economy at Manchester in 1947, he'd worked, as we heard before, as a, as a consultant for the Four Nation Caribbean Commission. He'd also published a short book in 1944 entitled An Economic Plan for Jamaica. Unlike Hayek, Lewis did not think that economic planning was an anathema or the first step on the road to serfdom. While Lewis never lost sight of the power of the market mechanism, he had, by the mid-1940s, acquired a more conventionally mid-century mistrust of ideas of necessary market equilibria. He was also firmly of the view that poorer countries could not progress or develop as the world, as the word soon became, 
without active efforts to promote industrial capitalist growth. All of which brings me too hurriedly to Lewis's famous work from 1954 and 1955 on economic growth. And most of all, to his work, Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor, the paper published in the Manchester School Journal in 1954 that, as we heard, was approvingly cited in his 1979 Nobel uh, Award. Before quickly running through this model and the gist of the 1955 book-length treatment of the theory of economic growth, which Lewis wrote alongside it, it's necessary to say a word or two about development economics at that time. This new subfield of economics was very much a product of the post-1945 era. Its main exponents, including Paul Rosenstein Radan in London, Alexander Geschenkron at Harvard, and Albert Hirschman, later a colleague of Lewis's at Princeton, were all refugees for sent from Central and Eastern Europe and they mainly developed their broad treatises on development or late industrialization with reference to economic problems in that part of the world. Lewis, of course, came from the imperial periphery, and he joined with economists from Latin America, including the Argentine Raoul Prebisch, and nationalists and economists from Africa and Asia in looking at growth and development across a broader geographical stage. What is most striking about his work in retrospect is the very, of this work in retrospect, is the very intuitive and generalized nature of the prescriptions for growth that came out of early development economics. Aside from the simple Harold Domar growth model, which in the 1940s had made the savings rate the main independent driver of long-run economic growth, the early interventions of Rosenstein, Rodin, Geschenkron and others were short prose essays commending some version or another of a big push for growth. Not without reason, it was assumed that most poor countries were trapped in a vicious circle of underdevelopment. Domestic savings rates were low and were linked to low rates of productivity, both within and without the main primary producing sector of the economy. Future growth, it was argued, depended on raising the savings rate. This could be affected either by state-imposed deferred gratification policies, less consumption now, and or by significant infusions of foreign capital, including foreign aid. It was further argued that the state, or a local planning commission as in India, should take control of a developing country's scarce savings and its equally scarce foreign exchange reserves and funnel them into capital goods-based projects in the area of infrastructural and industrial development. Done successfully, a concerted big push for growth would spring a developing country from the low-level equilibrium trap in which it currently found itself. Now, Lewis agreed with the starting point of these models. And a key proposition, I'll come on to the model in a moment, a key proposition in his Manchester School essay, very famous sentence from Lewis, is this. The central problem, said Lewis, in the theory of economic development is to understand the process by which a community saving and investing 4% or 5% of national income or less converts itself into an economy where voluntary saving is running at about 12% to 15% of national income or more. That was considered to be the fundamental uh, part of economic growth to which Lewis addressed himself. In the book that he published a year later, he slightly rephrased that famous sentence. It there reads, the central problem in the theory of economic growth is to understand the process by which a community is converted from a 5% saver to a 12% saver with all the changes in attitudes in institutions and in techniques which accompany this conversion. Now, if I had time tonight, I'd expand on that last clause at some length, because having reread Lewis's book just after Christmas, it seems to me it's an extraordinary tour de force of institutionalism and nuanced deductive reasoning. Indeed, 
I don't think there's much in the exceptional recent work of Asimoglu, Johnson, and Robinson that isn't prefigured in the theory of economic growth, where Lewis discusses in measured tones the relationships of economic growth to resources, which he sees largely as physical things like coal and oil, population, gender, caste, government, and imperialism. Although he has very little to say on the role of colonialism in the production of economic underdevelopment. But for now, back to 1954. Lewis broke with standard theory by announcing at the top of his essay that he'd be going back to the classical tradition, which from Adam Smith to Karl Marx, he said, and I quote from Lewis, all assumed or argued that an unlimited supply of labor was available at subsistence wages. Lewis also provided the first clear model of capital accumulation and economic development in the ex-colonial world. So if you've not met the model before, uh, let me simplify it and uh, speak to the slide on the screen. Simplifying greatly, we can say that Lewis's major achievement, which was by no means uncontroversial, was to present a typical developing country as one characterized by two unequal economic sectors. A large pre-capitalist sector, mainly centered on agriculture, and a much smaller and much more dynamic capitalist sector centered on manufacturing industry in urban areas, particularly the capital city. Lewis further suggested that the traditional agrarian sector of the economy, and I quote, was burdened by a large pool of surplus or largely redundant workers who contributed little or nothing to output. More formally, economists would say their marginal productivity was said to be effectively close to zero and sometimes even negative. And this is the idea that take away that worker and nothing would happen to overall productivity. They were surplus, almost with a big S, to requirements and thus could be more productively used elsewhere. Best of all, if surplus workers were moved to the formal urban economy, Lewis argued, local capitalists could pay them just a very small premium above the wage that they were getting in the countryside. Surplus labor was cheap labor that would furnish the employing urban capitalists with substantial extra profits whilst this labor stream existed. These profits, Lewis argued, would be reinvested by mainly private sector capitalists in the formal economy, causing the modern sector to grow relative to the agrarian or traditional sector until such time that all the surplus labor had been siphoned away from the countryside. At that point, real wages which have been held constant begin to move as you would expect with the forces of supply and demand in standard models. So the formal Lewis model can be very simply represented as you can see here. In time period one, a quantum of labor depicted here as L dot I is employed at the modern economy, in the modern economy at a wage rate W which is set at a notional 30% premium above the agricultural wage rate A. At this wage rate, the archetypal modern firm makes a profit equivalent to the sector that I describe as D1WF. And the basic idea is, with wages suppressed, the capitalists make the profit and reinvest it, and that shifts the quantity of labor out next time from L1 to L2, the profit is then in phase two, W, D, two, G, and so on. Until such time that surplus labor is drawn off. Now, of course, there's more to Lewis's career than this basic growth model. Later in his life, he turned to international economics. But Lewis is famous as a development economist and his infamy, a lot of people don't believe in this model largely derived from his work in Manchester in 1954 and 1955. In his professional career as an economist, Lewis was ahead of his time in suggesting not just that development was possible in the ex-colonial world, but in indicating how it could be made possible by enlightened state planning, strong support for private capitalist firms, 
consistent support for rural to urban migration, and crucially, by leadership. Indeed, his book from 1955 closes on page 418, it's not a short read, with these two sentences. It's possible, says Lewis, for a nation to take a new turn if it is fortunate enough to have the right leadership at the right time. In the last analysis, history is only the record of how individuals respond to the challenge of their times. All nations have opportunities which they may grasp if only they can summon up the courage and the will. This is something that people don't often understand, I think, when they look at Lewis. It wasn't just formal economic theorizing. It was very much a prescription around the sociology of leadership. Move to my second argument. Arthur Lewis was very much more than just a professional economist. We heard this today. In the late 1950s, Lewis worked for some time as the chief economic advisor to Ghana and for a fellow LSE alumnus, President Kwame Nkrumah. Unhappily, that partnership ended badly. Lewis's attempts to impose fiscal discipline upon Ghanaian planning were consistently undermined by Nkrumah's spending on the military, local farming elites and other cronies, and poorly executed development projects. Before leaving Ghana for his post here at the University of the West Indies and later at Princeton, Lewis had come to understand more clearly than he did even in the 1950s that economic policy making never took place within a political vacuum. And, and we had a wonderful description of this from Hamid earlier today. Very much to his credit, Lewis fell out with Nkrumah, Nkrumah precisely in his steadfast defense of two propositions. First, that it was the job of the state to facilitate private sector capital accumulation, not to replace it. And second, that sustainable economic growth would take decades to build up and could not simply be wished into existence overnight by politicians determined to take off into self-sustaining growth before a proper institutional framework had been put in place. But there is another dimension to Lewis's life that I want to pick up now, which has often been silenced in the story of the scholarship boy made good. Let's go back to the time that Lewis arrived at LSE. I noted earlier that Lewis became friends with non-economists like Ashton and Molinovsky, and so he did. But Lewis never felt entirely at ease in white London. He reported being stared at on the streets of the city in ways that made him feel uncomfortable and very aware of the color of his skin. Franz Fanon had a similar experience, you might know, in Paris. Understandably then, Lewis built friendships across London with men and women of color, as well as with colonial subjects who were troubled like himself by the structures of racism and empire in which they found themselves. Lewis became friends with men like George Padmore, the main leader in the 1930s and 1940s of a radical pan-Africanism that was centered in London as well as with the great Marxist historian and cricket lover, C.L.R. James, the author of a famous book that you might know on the Black Jacobin, the, the Black Haitian Revolutionary Toussaint Louverture, the book The Black Jacobins. As Tignor rightly remarks, racial justice and economic progress were Lewis's twin passions, were always two, racial justice and economic progress. Although I think the former has often been silenced in the story of Lewis the Economist. Consider too that when Lewis was appointed to a temporary assistant lectureship at LSE in 1937, it wasn't just a momentous occasion for the school, but also a controversial moment. And here I'm going to quote from Tignor. Tignor says, the decision to hire a black faculty member was referred to the highest authorities at LSE, making its way to the director A.H. Carr Saunders, who would not ordinarily have taken an interest in a junior hire. In a letter to the head of the Board of Governors Committee, Lord Stamp, the director, indicated that Lewis would lecture and take classes, as proposed by the professors of economics, 
but he would not do any advising. That is one-to-one -one work with students. He, Lewis, would therefore not see students individually, but only in groups. The appointments committee, Carl Saunders added, is, as I said, quite unanimous, but recognized that the appointment of a colored man may possibly be open to some criticism. So here is a man, you know, um, making his career at LSE in 1937, but not on the same basis as his white peers. In the event, LSE did allow Lewis to see students individually. But the appointment letter that he received in 1937 must have been read by the St. Lucian as a mark of both of his academic distinction and his otherness. It would also have reminded Lewis that doctoral studies at the LSE had only become a necessity when the colonial office refused his application to work as a civil servant in Trinidad, precisely on the basis that such positions were reserved then for persons of European parentage. And worse was still to come. Most people think that Lewis went from LSE seamlessly to Manchester. He didn't. Shortly before taking up his chair at Manchester in 1947, he was blocked from taking up the Chaddock chair in economics at Liverpool University, for which he was the unanimous choice of the selection committee, directly blocked by the vice chancellor of the university, one J.F. Mountford. Again, I read from Tignor. While conceding that Lewis had established a first-rate reputation as an economist, Mountford, in writing to Carl Saunders of the LSE, fellow Liverpudlian, worried about, quote, other considerations than high economic standing. The vice chancellor pointed out that the situation in Liverpool was quite different from that at the LSE. Not only would Lewis have to deal with a less sophisticated and worldly wise business community, but he would have to teach all the economic students enrolled in the university. In London, students had the option of attending other universities. In Liverpool, they did not. So Lewis was refused a chair which he got on merit at Liverpool and moved as a result to Manchester. So my broader argument then is that we must recognize that Lewis was a man of his time in a double sense. Sir Arthur came of age just as the possibility of economic development was forcing its way onto the intellectual and political landscapes of the post-war and post-colonial period. But Lewis had also grown up in an era when it was widely supposed that black men and women were not, to use a hideous phrase from the United States, fully human. Now it's true, of course, that abolitionist and Methodist movements in the 19th century contested not just the morality of slavery, but also the idea that we're not all God's creatures. Relatedly, the founding of Oberlin College in Ohio was famous not just as an early co-educational institution, but also one that admitted both white and black Americans. Further testimony to an important strand of pan-humanism. Nonetheless, the dominant strands of Western thought in the period from 1950 to 1850 to 1940 were undeniably rooted in crude forms of evolutionary anthropology and social Darwinism. As the economic gap opened up between the colonizer and the colonized in the period of the Great Divergence, the more obvious did it seem to many Western observers that some countries and peoples were blessed and deserving, while others were not. As, Edwards, as Edward Said has famously observed, this was the period when a self-confident Orientalism emerged in Europe that claimed, to observe, that claimed to observe sharp differences between the civilized and the savage, the Christian and the non-Christian, the West and the rest. Within these broad sets of discourses, it was considered unthinkable that the savage could be civilized except by the already civilized. This was the white man's burden to which I referred earlier. It also seemed unlikely to proponents of such a worldview that races marked in different ways uh, by the pseudoscience of phrenology could ever hope to rival the intellectual and political achievements of their Caucasian counterparts. That was the awful racist world into which Lewis was born 
raised, the world were in a major deba debate would be held in New York City, just five years before the birth of Sarafa, where the discussion was very precisely centered on whether or not all people were fully human. Now, one of the key speakers at that conference was W.E.B. Du Bois, who many of you will know was another towering black intellectual of the first half of the 20th century. Du Bois combined academic brilliance from his time at Harvard with political work and service, not least for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People in the US, but also later in life, again in Ghana with Kwame Nkrumah. Just how well Lewis knew Du Bois is hard to say, but they were friendly. But for both men, the possibility of development was not something that was abstract or simply economic. It was at least as much about the personal and political struggle to insist upon the equality of all women and men, upon the basic humanity of all people. Until that argument could be made and accepted, the possibility of development as we understand it today of autonomous leadership and self-directed economic and political transformation could not be envisaged or entertained. Lewis may not have been as central to this struggle as Padmore or Nkrumah or Du Bois or Vijaya Lakshmi Pandit, who many of you will know was Nehru's sister, who was central to uh, the, the founding of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, again note the date. But Tignor is right to flag Lewis's work in the late 1930s alongside Dr. Harold Moody in London and his League of Colored Peoples. Writing for the League's journal, The Keys, Lewis would regularly lambast the casual racism of British politicians and academics who wrote about Africa and Africa. Nowhere did he do so more tellingly than his review in 1937 of a book by Marjorie Perham called Africans and British Rule. And I quote now from Lewis, however inferior we may be, Lewis wrote, speaking of black people, however barbarous, inferiority and barbarity cannot justify the exploitation of all the areas where Europeans are firmly established. And he went on in the same vein, and I quote, to Miss Perham, it is from her own savagery that the African needs protection. White exploitation is to be seen merely as the inevitable and unfortunate accompaniment of the efforts to civilize. So here you have this brilliant academic in London just before the war, dealing with everyday racism and writing back against it. So let me finish. It's to be hoped that we've moved on a long way from these times. But we all know it's an incomplete project. If we have moved on, it's largely because of concerted academic and political work to challenge the so-called scientific racism that accompanied the great divergence. This is the point that I most want to underline in relation to Arthur Lewis and the possibility of development. In one very specific sense, the Colombian anthropologist Arturo Escobar is right to maintain that the modern era of development begins on the 20th of January, 1949, very specific date, with President Truman's speech announcing the Point Four Aid Program. The delivery and receipt of foreign aid defines the first world and the third world, or the second world in between. But in a far more profound sense, it seems to me, what we call the third world was created and racialized in the 150 years before 1949, a point that has been made by numerous academics, including Mike Davis. The possibility of development in the sense that we now understand and embrace it, something that is meant to be non-colonial and self-directed, could only be contemplated, I will argue, in the wake of the slow burning and still not completed struggle to insist upon the equal humanity of all ethnic and racial groups. Arthur Lewis was caught up in this struggle and contributed to it very significantly. Lewis did so, though, mainly by the personal, ex the, mainly by the personal example of his own achievements. 
but he also did it through his so-called non-economic writings, which have been unhelpfully neglected, and by his participation in the anti-colonial and anti-racist networks that he joined in London and beyond. For all this, and to conclude, Lewis was not a fan of the black studies or African-American studies agendas that forced themselves to the fore at Princeton and other US universities in the 1960s. Whilst he was intensely aware that he joined Princeton in 1963 as its first black faculty member, 1963, Lewis maintained that the most effective way to contest racial discrimination, the existence of which he never doubted, was by reasoned argument and individual black achievement. He was much less wedded to affirmative action programs and far less to academic enterprise that seemed to him to be based around identity or standpoint politics rather than disciplinary rigor. By the time that Lewis died in June 1991, all leading US colleges had made progress, some more than others, in recruiting black faculty members to their ranks. Lewis generally supported this, save for when it bolstered subject areas of which he disapproved. There is certainly no reason to think that he disapproved of programs to support black students with doctoral or postdoctoral fellowships. Nor is it likely that he would have challenged such hiring initiatives as we see today in most Ivy League schools, wherein central university funds are committed to departments that recruit and successfully mentor outstanding black or other minority faculty members. In the UK, I'm sad to say, there's much less progress to report. Arthur Lewis joined the LSE in 1937 as its first and only then black faculty member. Today, there are less than a handful, literally, of self-reporting black, here I define that as of African or Afro-Caribbean descent academics at the LSE. And when I left, only one full professor. Partly to address this situation, and mindful of the importance of cooperating with neighboring University College London, where the provost, Professor Michael Arthur, sponsored a public event, Why Isn't My Professor Black? LSE set up a black faculty initiative in 2014-15 to see how best the LSE and other leading academic institutions could empower black women and men to join the academy. Not surprisingly, the initiative encountered many of the issues and concerns that struck Arthur Lewis during the course of his career. It's possible within the law in the UK to advertise academic posts that might get larger fields for people from particular backgrounds. But that route might take a university down a road that Lewis warned against, which is not to say that it's always mistaken. The next, the next iteration of the initiative will aim to see more empirically where the blockages are and where best an institution like LSE might invest as it will need to, as I trust Durham will want to, to increase the pool of black ad academics in the UK. Perhaps it's the provision of targeted PhD scholarships. We shall see. Perhaps the real blockage is from school to university, or from local university to a research university, at the point of entry to a doctoral program. Whatever, the hope and expectation must be that the situation in five or 10 years' time must be significantly better than it is today. Arthur Lewis was a pioneering development economist and a lifelong champion of racial justice. He would be saddened, I think, to learn that there are less than 100 black professors working in the, U the UK Academy today out of a total professoriate of more than 18,000. We should aspire to do better. We should aspire to have more Arthur Lewis's. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Corbridge. It was an absolutely fascinating uh, lecture that you have just uh, delivered, a wide-ranging lecture um, telling us about uh, Sir Arthur's background, his childhood, his colonial background, his, the issues of, you raised the issues of race, the kinds of obstacles that he faced, the quality of his work, his outstanding um, academic career, his work in planning outside of the 
outside of the uh, university uh, in the, the, the academic setting, his impact in, 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 the, in, in, in um, planning, in, in, in development, um, the, 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 the um, leadership role he played across the board, um, a comprehensive approach to obviously a very complex uh, individual. Um, and it was curious that you talked about the work he did in the 1940s on colonial economics, which was the time when the British government had introduced the colonial development and welfare legislation. The first was in 1929, of course, at the time of the crash, so there was little money to, um, to sort of fund um, development here in the West Indies. But by the time of 1940, and certainly after the war, quite a lot of um, additional sums of money were provided. Um, and he, of course, was writing about colonial development at, at, at that time. So we've heard an absolutely fascinating, and I would say perhaps an unconventional um, lecture, I think, um, Professor Corbridge. We were probably more expense, uh, expecting a rather sort of dry economic um, lecture, but I think you've, you've, you've delivered an absolutely fascinating um, uh, presentation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for questions. I am sure that you have a great many questions uh, for our distinguished, distinguished lecturer. There are ushers in the aisles with microphones. They will bring them to you when you have raised, uh, when you raise your hands. Now, when you get the microphone and I point out to you, and you wish to ask a question, can you identify yourself, and I'd like to ask you to keep your questions focused and to the point. So, the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. The first question, do we have one? We have one here in the fourth row. Please, can you bring the microphone to this lady? Thank you very much, good evening. Um, Professor Corbridge, I really admire the way you presented this um, anecdote, I would say, on Sir Arthur Lewis. And what is, what is telling now in the 21st century is that his themes that he put forward in the economic um, development could be used now, but how many of us are moving away from the things like race and, um, you know, color, creed, and so, and thinking about how sustainable we, we can become to safeguard the humans on this earth today. As we would see, the UN has gone back to sustainable development from, you know, um, the 2000 um, goal, Millennium Development Goal, we are moving forward and other countries are thinking about sustainable development. And we need um, thinkers like you to write more or bring forward to the public. And as you say, the, um, the more the black people need to go and educate to a level and set ourselves free from this blackness that we carry about because time is running out on, on development and provision of the food, the shelter, and clothing. If you think about the Malthusian theory, we need to fix things. And I am putting it to you as the professor to move us forward and can you point out some of uh, what, what the gaps are now in the 21st century. Thank you. Are there any other questions before if Professor Corbridge answers that one? Do we have a second question? Not just yet. Professor Corbridge, if you can answer that one, and meanwhile, I'm sure our audience will be thinking about other things to challenge you on. Professor Corbridge. Thank you, David. Well, I, there are a number of challenges, I think, in that question. Um, I mean, for me, what's most interesting is, is, is the premise of the question, which is about the continued relevance of Lewis's work today. And I actually found it very interesting to reread the theory of economic growth um, 
between Christmas and New Year. So there are certain things, I think, that have not stood the test of time terribly well. The, 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 the actual core model of uh, surplus labor, I think, empirically, um, is one that most economists wouldn't necessarily support now. And I think also his view of resources, um, that resources are fundamentally things out there in the ground and are likely to deplete, is at odds with a more modern account that the ultimate resource is between our ears. That, you know, it's Plato's, uh, Plato's old aphorism about necessity being the mother of invention. So some things are probably not worn too well. However, more generally, um, I, I find the book quite remarkable rereading it because what it does fundamentally in very nuanced ways in very clear, crisp prose is simply to ask the reader to think, well, what is holding back a latecomer country or a developing country? And he takes you through a series of possibilities. So in some cases, it could be distortions in labor markets like caste, for example, or gender. But fundamentally, it does tend to come back to savings. And I think in many ways, um, modern economic growth has come back to that idea. Um, not necessarily a concerted big push for growth in the way that it was understood in the 1940s and 1950s, but there needs to be a balanced menu of interventions by well-founded government, supportive of private capitalist development, and fundamentally using savings wisely. Um, in many ways, I think those are fairly elementary propositions, but they were more clear in Lewis's work earlier on, I think, than any other development economist. So I think in that sense, that the vast majority of his book, when you reread it, uh, what are we now, you know, 63 years later, um, it seems to me to have stood the test of time remarkably well. Are there any other questions? Uh, at the back, we've got one of the top Good evening, uh, Keston Perry is my name. Um, I wanted for you, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, I thought it was, it, 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 it was very um, comprehensive, but I wanted to find out um, what do you think are the reasons for the lack of progression among black minority and ethnic groups in the UK academic system. You've sort of mentioned it in a bit. Um, and I suppose sort of glossed over slightly the sort of structural and systemic issues um, that may prevent um, black academics from progressing. And, and what perhaps are you doing at Durham? I just returned from the UK. so. I'm very, very interested in this because I was a student at SOAS. Right. Um, and I just wanted to hear a bit about that. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's an issue that's beginning to gain some traction in the UK where, I mean, ordinarily people perhaps would distinguish between the progression of, uh, we, we, we use the acronym BAME uh, in the UK, black and minority ethnic. And I think sometimes if you're looking at people of um, South Asian descent or East Asian descent, they've moved into the academy, um, perhaps in ways that have been more encouraging than uh, young black academics in particular. So there's been a recent focus, you'll know at SOAS, you'll know at UCL, uh, LSE, and hopefully now at Durham, on this issue of the lack of progression. As to what is happening, then it seems to me that there's a number of things that we need to look at. One is um, the, the sort of unconscious bias or low-level racism that is doubtless there in the system. Uh, those of you that have read Freakonomics will know that if you, um, if, if, if you can um, look at a CV and take out a person's last name, we get very different responses from the point of view of selectors in all sorts of public institutions where people are identified clearly as belonging to one ethnic group rather than more generally. So I don't deny at all that that's likely to be a part of the problem. Then I think that there have been issues um, related to uh, incomes and progression um, within school, the absence of fellowship support, the absence of targeted 
PhD scholarships, all the way through to um, which areas universities target for growth. Um, one has to be careful here. Uh, as Lewis pointed out, people can excel in all sorts of different areas, but if a university history department puts a lot of money into, I don't know, medieval church history in the UK, you're very likely to get a different field of people applying for a job than if you had it on post-colonial history or the history of Africa. So I think there's a number of things that are coming together. I think what UCL and LSE have done, Heston, I think was your name if I got it right, is, is to try and sort of look empirically at where the blockage points are and to work it through. The Americans are clearly much further ahead. Other questions? One at the back. Good Sorry, I don't have um, a question, but really a, um, a commendation. I want to say thank you, thank you very much, very, very much for this broad um, academic um, presentation. And what you, I think what you've done, you've brought Arthur Lewis to life. He has impacted on our lives, and the average Trinidadian and West Indian does not know that the effect that he's had on their lives. I think this, your presentation this evening has bring him down and has humanized him. At one po point, you mentioned that he was um, blocked by the British government in a, um, assuming a position in Trinidad. I have a different take on that story, which was given to me by, um, my, by George John, the legendary George John. Um, thing. And he says that Arthur Lewis came and applied for a position as town clerk at the city council, Port of Spain city council. And it's the city council that deemed him too qualified. And hence the reason he jumped in a boot and went back and went to, um, and, and for the PhD. I'm not too sure which one is it, but you are saying that it, is, well, it was the British um, people who, thing, but he says it was the Port of Spain, <laughs> which was a really a laughable story. Thank you again. Thank, thank you very much for sharing that insight. Um, it's obviously, you know, we had a number of different stories today at the seminar this morning about different accounts of his life. So it's a lot more work clearly to be done. And you know, I make no secret of the fact that I'm largely dependent on his biographer for some parts of the talk. But as, as you said, I think what's really fascinating about Lewis and what makes him so relevant today is it, it, he, 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 it strikes me that he was a very multifaceted person making his way with tremendous distinction at every point of his life in terms of examinations, lectureships, all the way to the Nobel Prize, but dealing with very difficult personal circumstances because of the structures of racism and empire. But as far as one can tell, I mean, it would be interesting to know more from people that have known him, with tremendous dignity throughout. Um, and it must have been an extraordinary life to be the only black faculty member at the LSE, the only black faculty member at Princeton. You know, one can only imagine uh, what that must have been like. And that other side to him and the friendships that he had um, with people in the Pan-Africanist movement in London, people like Padmore and others, it seems to me to be a story that's been somewhat silenced in many accounts of uh, Arthur Lewis. I mean, going back to what David said rather kindly uh, in his remarks, um, partly because I'm not uh, an economist, um, I think by not being a, you know, paid up member of the economics profession, you are able perhaps to see him much more in the round and he was far more, as we know, uh, than simply an economist. Not that there's anything wrong with being a good economist. But. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Peter. Um, I hope you don't mind if I, if I sit. Um, um, Anthony Gonzalez. Um, with respect to the relevance of Arthur Lewis, um, as a student of development economics in the 60s, my impression always was that uh, Lewis's work was confined largely to certain countries that had a surplus labor, countries that had a subsistence sector and a small emerging manufacturing sector. These would be India, Egypt, and so on. Yeah. And uh, when you moved out of that set, um, it was very difficult to apply the original, his original work. 
he had given some advice to this region uh, as to how to go about industrializing. And um, he had many critics in this part of the world. Uh, some of them pretty, pretty vigorous in terms of how they felt his work was a, a kind of even metropolitan kind of imposition or idea as to how we should develop. They felt he ignored a lot of things like the culture, um, the, the history of the, of the region, and, and stuff like that. So at the time, at that time, I would say there was a, a question mark over his relevance. The second point I wanted to make is that in today's world, I'm not sure how to assess his relevance because uh, development and the whole theory of growth um, has moved fundamentally away from savings and capital uh, investment, and it has moved largely in the area of technology, uh, knowledge development, um, institutional governance and stuff like that and so on. It's become more multidisciplinary, and maybe the point you raised about Lois one and Lois two, but Lois moved into the question of institution savings plus institution. I think he himself probably began to gain that insight later on. But now, today, um, I'm not sure to what extent the original work um, remains fundamentally relevant to where the field has emerged in terms of the prescriptions we get today now for development in this part of the world. Thank you. Again, many thanks for sharing those thoughts, which uh, you know, I very much uh, agree with. We, we actually had a fascinating session this morning. I'm not sure if you were there. Is, is it Peter? Um, on some of the other contributions that Arthur Lewis made, I mean, particularly Ahmed here to my right was talking about him as being acknowledged by Lippard as the fundamental father, inventor of consociationalism. So the, the, the achievements of the man, I think, are widely recognized and are more, more plural than I'd uh, understood uh, even before today. I think I, I, I do agree with you um, that things have moved on obviously from that obsession with savings and capital accumulation in the 1950s. Rereading though Lewis, it, it strikes me that he was very much an institutionalist um, as most people were probably before the, uh, the, the 1980s and 1990s when there seems to be a movement away from that in the direction of the Washington Consensus. And, you know, even somebody like Danny Roderick at Harvard fundamentally says that you can uh, put all of development economics on one page as physical capital accumulation, human capital accumulation, and productivity, recognizing that productivity is the thing that economists find hard to agree on uh, in terms of definitions and measurement. And I think in that sense, Lewis is very much part of a long pedigree of development economics. And, I mean, I, I do feel that if you when you, when you reread his work on things like caste in particular, um, or local farming systems, of which there's a lot in the theory of economic growth, you do get that strong sense of the importance of asymmetries of power, um, poorly functioning institutions, and the need for leadership to move people away from both. So I think he's both, um, he's clearly a man of his time. The 1950s in particular, but I, I do feel that he's more contemporary than some of the people that he worked with at that time. Any other comments or questions, remarks? Keith, you were at the session this morning and you presented, so we expect you'll have something quite wonderful to say. Thank you very much for that. Um setting up a set of expectations, David, <laughs> which I'm guaranteed to, um, Disappoint. to undershoot. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Corbridge. Uh, I thought that was a pretty exceptional presentation. Uh, I just want to jump off from the, from the last question. Uh, when I was first introduced to Lewis, on this campus as a student, uh, it was mostly confined to his earlier work, to the, the focus on industrialization, and uh, on what I call uh, Lewis the economic theoretician. 
Now, when I just started doing my PhD work and thesis, I came upon growth and fluctuations, and the world changed for me. Mm. And particularly, his understanding of how to utilize long cycle theory to explain long-term historical change. Now, Lewis is only one of a few economists who could be defined as you know, almost your standard garden variety economist who also takes into account this longer view of history. And by doing so, he uh, argues, particularly in growth and fluctuations, in fact, it's the last page or the second to last page, he argues that trade is not the engine of growth. It is technological change. And so, in many respects, the, that book for me sets up the argument uh, as a critique against commodities and commoditization. And he is very vociferous in it. In fact, in so many respects, it's his retort to the plantation economy model. So, Maybe he did respond <laughs> uh, to the critiques that were leveled at him. Uh, but what I find particularly useful is the way that, as an economic historian, he has this very grand understanding of what's happening in multiple parts of the world. One of the things I get my students to do is to read his Nobel Prize lecture. And in it, he makes a prediction which has proven to be correct. He argues that because trade, if, if countries are dependent on trade as an engine of growth, that they would largely be disappointed because when the global economic cycle shifts, they go back, what he called the escalator model. And so, Small economies or peripheral economies are heavily dependent on the core economies for facilitating their trade will experience reversals. He then argues that those economies that have been able to delink themselves from this escalator model and are able to one depend on deepening their domestic economy and build domestic consumption as well as engage in technological upgrading will make the difference. And so he says, other than the settler economies, like Canada, Australia, um, and so on, the only other countries that would be able to make this breakaway would be those that have a history of industrialization prior to European colonization. And he identifies India and China. And and so he sets up the argument that what I call the Big South is going to rise, and the rest of the South is going to be mired in a very problematic transition out of underdevelopment, if you want to call it that. So, uh, so when I give it to my students, they're like, wow, um, uh, this guy is on the money, uh, because he does make the point that, the, which is the title of the lecture, the slowing up of the engine of growth. And so that was a prediction that has proven to be correct. Because since that period, we've had a slower process of growth in the global economy. So in that respect, Lewis's long cycle theory um, has been proven to be correct. Thank you very much. I hope I've lived up to your expectations, David. <laughs> yes, you did rather. Professor Corbridge will now respond. Well, uh, <laughs> absolutely fascinating, and um, th thanks so much for sharing that, because th there's only a certain number of things, obviously, you can do in 50 minutes, although 50 minutes will seem like a long time when you're sitting in an audience, no doubt, but the, the long cycle work that, um, as you say, Lewis um, prefigured, particularly in the Nobel Prize um, lecture, I is fascinating, and I can't say any more on it than you've just said so eloquently. On, on the other issue of technological change, I mean, I do find that quite fascinating because I, I think that Lewis um, is very much a man of his time in emphasizing the importance of technological change. And the, the way that you, one usually thinks about Lewis in relation to technological change is through savings and investment or the sorts of things that I was talking about just now. But 
fascinated me going back to the theory of economic growth, although it doesn't necessarily use the phrase, because he is an institutionalist, he's also looking at things like expropriation risk, he's looking at the rule of law, so he's looking at the fundamental institutions and the role of leadership attached to those, and I think in that, in that sense too, that obviously feeds through to Lewis as a sort of political scientist as well as uh, an economist. And, uh, and that part of um, Lewis's legacy, I think, is another one that we could easily point current generations of students to. There, there are parts of Lewis, obviously, for something, you know, 70 years um, ago that people are going to look at and think, that seems odd. Um, you know, we've, that can't be right. I mean, I, I personally find some of his um, accounts of population and resources rather limited. But there are other things that strike me as remarkably contemporary as you just said in, in Lewis's work. And it's, it's quite, it's, it's such fun to sort of share that with students and then to discuss it in the light, in, in the light of the present. So thank you very much for sharing. Do we have any more comments or questions at the front here on the left? In your presentation, you mentioned what can the UK do better for inclusion, but I think targeted scholarships on their own are not going to solve our problems. Education must seriously consider and advocate for reparations, which is a way for Britain to acknowledge their crimes against humanity. Failing this, we are trying to build on quicksand. Also, I'd like to ask, what do you think about the arguments that argue that question the usefulness of Lewis's theory unless people can recapture self-respect and determination and can engage others from that position, or else his theory tends to serve the, colonialist, the, the colonials and not our interests. I mean, again, it's a very um, wide set of engagements that you're proposing there. So, um, if I understood it correctly, um, in, in terms of some of the practical things that can be done in terms of advancement within the academy, targeted scholarships would just be, would just be one. I, I entirely, though, accept the point that it, it's much more about the decolonization of knowledge. And it's, it's, as you say, it's about respect for another person's point of view. I don't think that necessarily has to be um, form of standpoint politics though, because I do, I do strongly believe that there are, there are certain arguments that have greater weight than others. And, I mean, that would have been Lewis's point of view as well, I think. So I think, you know, there's, there's a number of areas there that one has to work through quite carefully. It's, it's interesting going back to Lewis and rereading his work, what's, um, what's not in a book? I think it's Salman Rushdie's second novel where he sort of quotes Scheherazade at the beginning to say that the telling of one story imposes a form of censorship on other stories that could be told. Um, there's not a great deal in Lewis about gender. Um, there's, interestingly, there's not much on colonialism in any detail. There's imperialism is treated, but not, not the effects of colonialism. Now, perhaps that goes back to the point about how Lewis was understood in parts of a non-metropolitan world. So I mean, it seems to me that you, you, you can again go back to Lewis to read what is in there and what is not in there in, in the light of contemporary concerns as well. Thank you. Uh, any more questions or comments? Since there are no more, I think we, we might just want to remember what I said at the beginning, that Sir Arthur was vice chancellor, the first vice chancellor of this university. He will have become the first vice chancellor at the transition of the, this institution from the University College of the West Indies, which was a college of the University of London, to a, a, an institution that was able to grant its, its, its own degree, so its second charter, as it were. Um, that was around the time that the planning was taking place now for the establishment of this campus out of the Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture and then subsequently a third campus in Barbados. So he was vice chancellor therefore at a pivotal period in the history of the University of the West Indies and it is something that we ought not to forget. Now ladies and gentlemen, we have come to uh,
the part of the uh, evening which is always enjoyable for us and in keeping with our custom of the U U University of the West Indies, I will now ask uh, Dr. Ghani to present our uh, distinguished lecturer who's uh, uh, made a, presented a fascinated, uh, fascinating lecture with a token uh, of appreciation for all the hard work uh, he has done here today. Dr. Ghani, Professor Corbridge, will you please come stand up? And I do hope that this will be the, the start of a very close relationship between our two universities. I certainly look forward to that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dr. Ghani, please so remain in front of, the, uh, of this banner. Um, we have another presentation. Dr. Ghani. After that um, air raid warning, Dr. Ghani will now make a presentation to Ms. Sims. Ms. Sims, please come up to the um, platform. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Gandhi will now uh, make uh, closing remarks uh, to signal the end of this uh, evening's proceedings. Dr. Gandhi. Thank you very much, uh, David. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've uh, been treated to a very, very uh, profound lecture that was most enjoyable, I thought. Could you join me in giving Professor Corbridge another round of applause? <laughs> so I, I do want to thank you, Professor Corbridge, for uh, taking time away from your duties at Durham to uh, come out to Trinidad and to give this lecture to be the first uh, of what I would like to become an annual event the Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture to be delivered every year on the day of his birthday. And uh, you've done us a great honor in being the first uh, uh, person to give the lecture in that series. Thank you very much. Thank you. I also want to thank Ms. Joan Sims for accompanying you this evening and to thank her very much for her presence here this evening. Thank you. I also want to thank, uh, <clears throat> in absentia, uh, Ms. Denise Baker, your executive assistant at Durham. <laughs> who I've had many conversations with and who has been absolutely brilliant in terms of supporting everything that I needed to set up in respect of your visit. Please do convey my best wishes to her and my uh, deep gratitude for all of her efforts. I will do. Thanks very much thank for you. saying that. It's very kind. Uh, I also want to thank our campus principal, Professor Brian Copeland, uh, for his uh, support uh, for this venture when I uh, put it to him um, late last year, shortly after I had um, assumed duties as director, I spoke to him and told him of my idea to have a Sir Arthur Lewis Day for the campus, and uh, he supported it up front right away, and there was full support from the principal's office, and I certainly want to thank Professor Copeland for all of his support in making today possible, uh, and I'm very grateful to our campus principal. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Marketing and Communications Department um, for uh, the support they've given, especially Ms. Shireen Ali, 
who uh, was <coughs> uh, designated by marketing and communications to be a contact person and worked with us um, uh, from start to finish in terms of ensuring that all the events today uh, were fully supported by marketing and communications and all of the work that went on before leading up to this. I also want to thank uh, First Citizens Bank, uh, Ms. Karen Dabesi, the Chief Executive Officer of First Citizens Bank for some of the sponsorship that they have given us uh, in order to make uh, the events of today possible. I want to thank Ms. Betty McComey and her team. Betty McComey, as many of you know, is the Executive Assistant to our campus principal, and uh, she left no stone unturned in terms of planning all of this in the midst of also planning a very significant funeral that took place uh, in, in Trinidad and Tobago quite recently uh, and the role that the University of the West Indies had to play uh, in that and in the midst of all of that was also keeping her eye on this ball and making sure uh, that we were fully supported in all that we were planning uh, to do and I'm very, very grateful to Betty McComey and her team in the office of the campus principal. I want to thank Francine Alain, Kathy Ann Modest, Ephraim Thompson, Sheldon Warner, <clears throat> and other staff at uh, Salises uh, who have worked tirelessly with me uh, to be able to make the events of today uh, come to pass, and um, I'm very, very grateful to them for all of their efforts in making this happen, and the rest of the staff at Salises. I want to thank Godfrey St. Bernard, Roy McCree and Priya Mohan, my academic colleagues in Salises, for their support for this venture, their participation, their involvement, and I, I want to thank them very much for that. I want to thank Mr. Noel Corbett, the Director of Campus Security, uh, for all of the support that he has given for uh, our uh, events uh, and, and all that has gone on today in providing uh, effective security arrangements and support. The Daga Auditorium staff, the staff in this facility, um, I'm very grateful to, to them for all that they have done. Uh, Mr. Dexter Otley, who has been driving uh, Professor Corbridge around, I'm very grateful to Dexter for all of his uh, efforts ensuring that Professor Corbridge was uh, safely delivered to and from the campus uh, for all of the meetings, the events, and everything else that we had arranged for him. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, let me announce that our next year's lecture will be held on Wednesday, the 23rd of January, 2019, and the lecturer will be Professor Sir Timothy Besley, who is the W. Arthur Lewis Professor of Development Economics at the London School of Economics and Political Science, a position that was created with the uh, instrumental assistance of Professor Corbridge when he was uh, Deputy Director and Provost at the London School of Economics and Political Science, that post having been created in 2015. And I've been in touch with Professor Besley. We have confirmed for next year on the 23rd of January 2019. And uh, you'd be happy to know that he was in fact knighted in the Queen's New Year's Honours list this year. And um, we look forward to seeing him uh, when he comes next year for the Sir Arthur Lewis Distinguished Lecture, the second.